All right, learners, ready to dive deep. Today, we're tackling private company valuation. Definitely a crucial topic, especially for those tackling the CFA level two. Yeah, we're going beyond the stock market, looking at companies that, well, aren't listed on public exchanges, those hidden gems, maybe not so gems sometimes. Exactly. It's a whole different world. Think of public companies. They're like ships sailing in broad daylight, right? You can track their every move financial strategies, everything's out there. Okay, I like that, makes sense. Now, private companies, more like submarines, navigating in the depths, way less visibility. So public companies are transparent, private companies are stealthy, got it. But why does this matter so much when we're trying to figure out what a company is actually worth? It impacts everything. The information we have, the methods we use. With public companies, you've got data galore, stock prices, reports, analysts all over it. Yeah, it's all out in the open. Right. But with private companies, it's like piecing a puzzle together, and sometimes you're missing a few pieces. So it's like being a financial detective. I like that. You got it. Challenging for sure, but also a lot more intriguing. And that's where things get interesting for anyone studying for the CFA Level 2 exam. Ah, yes. Our CFA candidates are probably eager to connect this to their studies. So where should they focus their attention? One of the first things is understanding the fundamental difference between public and private companies, especially the features that impact how we approach valuation. Okay, so what are those key differences? Transparency or the lack of it, that's huge. Public companies, they operate in a fishbowl, right? Yeah. Standardized reports, market data readily available. Yes. Yeah. But private companies, they can be much more, well, opaque. Different levels of disclosure. Okay, so public companies are an open book. Private companies are more of a closed vault. Got it. What else should our CFA studiers keep in mind? Think about size and life cycle. Public companies. They tend to be larger, more mature. They've gone through the whole IPO process, regulatory hoops, all that. Yeah, they're the big players. Exactly. Private companies, you've got a wider range. Tiny startups just starting out, family businesses running for generations, even companies that were public but went private. So a much more diverse ecosystem in the private markets, mm -hmm. that definitely adds to the challenge of valuation. What other key differences are there? Ownership and control, that's a big one. Public companies, they usually have dispersed ownership, shares spread among tons of investors. Well, lots of cooks in the kitchen. In a way, yeah. And often that means there's a separation between who owns the company and who manages it. You get a CEO and a team running things. Gotcha. So less hands-on for the owners. Pretty much. Now, private companies, it's different. Ownership's often concentrated. Founders, families, a small group of investors holding most of the shares. And they're often actively involved in running the company. So with public companies, you have this separation. But with private companies, ownership and management, it's much more intertwined. Makes sense. What else do we need to consider? Liquidity. Public companies, their shares are traded on exchanges easy to buy and sell, that's a huge plus for investors. Makes sense, you can cash out easily. Exactly. Now, private companies, it's a different story. Their shares are illiquid, way harder to buy and sell. Ah, so liquidity or the lack of it, that plays a huge role in how we value these private companies. Why is that? Because it directly impacts risk and return. With public companies, if you need to, you just sell your shares, right? Easy. But with private companies, you're basically locked in. Finding a buyer, tough. You might have to wait for an IPO, a sale, something like that, which could be years down the line. And because of that, investors, well, they want a discount to make up for that extra risk. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. So transparency, size, ownership, and liquidity, all these things make valuing private companies a unique challenge. It's like adding extra layers to the valuation puzzle. Exactly. But don't worry, we're here to help you navigate those layers. Now that we've got the groundwork, let's move on to the exciting part, the actual valuation methods ready to roll up our sleeves and dive into the numbers. Absolutely. Let's crack this valuation code and unlock the secrets of private company valuation. So we've established that valuing private companies, it's not exactly a walk in the park. We need those specialized tools, a keen eye for detail. What methods do we actually use to figure this out? You know, you might be surprised to hear the core principles of valuation, they're pretty much the same across the board publicly traded, giant, tiny startup, it doesn't matter. We're still trying to figure out the intrinsic value of a business, how, by looking at its future earnings, assets, and market position. Okay, so the basic concepts are the same, but I'm guessing there are some twists when we apply them to private companies, right? Of course. 
We're dealing with limited information, less liquidity. We have to adjust our approach. But here's the good news. We have three main valuation methods. They're all part of the CFA Level 2 curriculum, by the way. Oh, good to know for our CFA candidates. So what are these three methods? We've got the income approach, the market approach, and the asset base approach. Each one gives us a different perspective on a company's value, like looking through different lenses. I like that. So let's start with the income approach. What's the main idea behind this one? It's all about cash flow. Think of it like how much is a money machine worth today based on how much cash it's going to spit out in the future. Okay, so we're looking at future earnings potential? Exactly. And we use this technique called discounted cash flow analysis, or DCF, to project those future cash flows, then we discount them back to present value. Ah, discounted cash flow. Yeah. So we're saying, hey, a dollar tomorrow is worth less than a dollar today. Time value of money, uncertainty, all that jazz. But projecting cash flows for a private company limited data, unpredictable growth, that seems tough. It definitely can be. That's why analysts often use a simpler version of DCF, something called the capitalized cash flow method. Capitalized cash flow. Break that down for us. Imagine a company making a steady stream of income, like a rental property, reliable, consistent. This method assumes that income keeps flowing at a constant rate, forever. We're basically calculating how much money you'd need today to generate that same income stream, Forever, instead of projecting over a specific period, we're taking a snapshot of earning power, assuming it stays that way. Okay, a bit more straightforward, but it comes with those assumptions built in. What if those assumptions don't hold up? Exactly. It works for stable businesses, mm -hmm. predictable growth, but a tech startup, constant growth, not so much. We have to be careful, choose the method that fits the situation. Right, no one size fits all. So that's capitalized cash flow one part of the income approach. Are there others? Of course. For companies with intangible assets, things like a strong brand or patents, we have the excess earnings method. It helps separate the value of those intangible assets from the tangible ones. Intangible assets, those can be tricky to value. How does this method actually work? We start by figuring out the return we'd expect from just the tangible assets. Then we look at the actual earnings, anything above that expected return. Well, that's attributed to the intangible stuff. So if a company is earning more than we'd expect based on its physical stuff, that extra value is coming from something intangible, like valuing the secret sauce that makes the company unique. I like that. You got it. We're isolating those intangible assets, valuing that competitive advantage. But we have to be careful, not overestimating their value or assuming they'll last forever. Okay, so we've got discounted cash flow, capitalized cash flow, and excess earnings, all part of the income approach. It seems like a lot to consider. But let's move on to our next method, the market approach. What's the idea behind this one? This is all about comparison shopping. We're looking at the market. What are similar companies worth? It's like selling your house. You look at what other houses in your neighborhood sold for. Right. The market as a benchmark, a guide for what buyers are paying. But how do we find comparable companies for private companies that aren't publicly traded? Time to put on our detective hats again. We have two main methods within the market approach. Guideline transactions method and guideline public company method. Okay, two methods. Break them down for us. Guideline transactions, we look at multiples from past acquisitions of similar companies. It's like those sold signs in your neighborhood seeing those prices. But remember, no two deals are exactly alike. We have to adjust for any differences. Right, a company bought during a boom might be worth more than one sold during a downturn. Apples to apples, right. What about the guideline public company method? That's where we look at publicly traded companies similar to our private target. We use their trading multiples as a reference point, of course, adjusting for differences in risk, growth, all that. Got it. So we're looking at both past deals and the valuations of similar public companies to get a good picture. But what if the public companies are overvalued themselves? Wouldn't that mess up our valuation? That's a great point. We can't just blindly trust market multiples. We have to understand the context, make sure those multiples are reasonable, adjust them if needed. The market can be irrational sometimes. Got to stay grounded in the fundamentals of the business. Right. The market approach is a tool, but we have to use it wisely. So that's income and market. What about the third method, the asset-based approach? This one's different. We're valuing the company's assets and liabilities, basically taking stock of what it owns and owes. It's like figuring out your own net worth. You add up your assets, subtract your debts. Okay, so we're saying the company's worth the sum of its parts minus any debts. Sounds simple enough, but I'm guessing there's more to it. You bet. 
This approach is useful for companies with lots of tangible assets like real estate or equipment, but it doesn't always capture the full picture, especially for companies with lots of intangible assets or high growth potential. Yeah, sometimes the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, right? A great management team, a strong brand, those aren't always on the balance sheet. Exactly. This method gives us a floor, a minimum value, but we have to consider those other approaches, income and market, to get a truly complete picture. So three main approaches, each with pros and cons. But even after crunching the numbers, we're not done, right? There's more to it. You're absolutely right. Now we need to factor in control and marketability. Control and marketability, huh? It sounds like those can really shake things up in the valuation game. Let's start with control. What does that even mean when we're talking about private companies? Think of it like you're the captain of the ship a controlling interest. That gives you the power to make the big decisions, strategy, investments, who's running the show, all that, and that kind of power. Investors are usually willing to pay a premium for it. Okay, so control premium, it's like paying extra for that driver's seat, right? You're in control, you can potentially make things happen, right. but at what point does that premium become too much? Yeah. When does it stop making sense? That's the million dollar question. It's not just about a formula, it's also about judgment. How big is that controlling stake? What's the potential for making the company more valuable? Even the people involved, their track records, that all plays a role. So there's no easy answer. It's all about the specifics of the situation. Yes. Makes sense. What about the opposite then? What happens when you don't have control? You're a passenger on that ship now. You might have opinions, but you don't have the same influence as the captain. So a discount for lack of control, that's reflecting that reduced value. You don't have the same power to steer things. So. A smaller stake, less say in the company's direction, it's going to be worth less than a controlling stake. Okay, that makes sense. Let's talk about marketability, or I guess the lack of it. How does that play into all of this? Remember, we talked about private company shares. They're illiquid, right? Mm -hmm. Harder to buy and sell. That's a risk for investors. They can't just cash out easily if they need to or if they're not happy with the company. It's like owning a rare antique. Might be valuable, but good luck finding a buyer when you need one. Exactly. And because of that, investors want a discount. A discount for lack of marketability or DLOM. Basically, a price reduction because it's harder to sell those shares makes it less appealing. Okay, so we've got control premiums, lack of control discounts, lack of marketability discounts. It's a lot to keep track of. It's like adjusting the lens, right, to get a clearer picture of what's actually going on. But there's one more big piece of the puzzle, the discount rate. How do we figure out the right one? especially for private companies where the future can feel so uncertain. That's the key, isn't it? The discount rate, it represents the opportunity cost. What could an investor earn by investing in something else with a similar risk profile? But with private companies, nailing that discount rate can be tricky. So if I could invest in a public company with a similar risk and get a 10% return, I'd want at least 10% for the private company, right? Otherwise, why bother with the extra risk? You got it. But the traditional CAPM model it doesn't quite work here. Private companies, they don't have a beta, remember? We have to consider other factors, things that reflect the unique risks of going private. Okay, so no beta, no playing. What kind of adjustments are we talking about? One option is the expanded CAPM. It adds premiums for size and company-specific risks. So we're basically saying, hey, this private company is smaller, riskier than a big public company, so got to bump up that discount rate. It's like adding extra padding, right? The riskier it is, the more padding you need in case you fall. That's a great way to think about it. The size premium, it reflects the fact that smaller companies can be more volatile, more likely to fail. And the company-specific risk premium, that captures any unique risks tied to that particular company, their business model, the industry, even their management team. So we're tailoring that discount rate to the specifics of the company. Makes sense. You mentioned another option, the build-up approach. What's that all about? That one's even more tailored. We add a bunch of risk premiums to the risk-free rate to get our required rate of return. Okay, so starting with that risk-free rate, what you could earn on something super safe, like a U.S. Treasury bond, then adding on premiums for different kinds of risk. Exactly. We might add a premium for equity risk, for size, for industry risk, even for risks specific to that company. It's like building a custom risk profile, brick by brick. This makes sense, but how do we actually figure out how big those risk premiums should be? Is it all just guesswork? This is where experience and judgment really come in. Analysts look at historical data, industry benchmarks, and the specific details of the company to figure out reasonable premiums. There are databases and publications that can help with this too. 
So even in this world of numbers and models, there's still a lot of art involved. There is valuation. It's not just a science, it's an art too. You need those technical skills, but also a deep understanding of the company, the industry, the whole economic landscape. That's what makes it so interesting, don't you think? I think it's safe to say we've taken a deep dive into private company valuation. We've explored the key differences from public companies, the reasons for doing valuations, the tools and techniques analysts use, and those important adjustments for control, marketability, and the discount rate. We've also seen how valuation is a dynamic process. It's not just plugging numbers into a formula. It's about critical thinking, judgment, and being comfortable with uncertainty especially in the world of private companies. So learners, whether you're studying for the CFA level two or venturing into the world of private company investing, keep those valuation principles in mind. Analyze the evidence, compare notes, challenge those assumptions, and never be afraid to ask the tough questions. And most importantly, keep diving deep. There's always something new to learn.